Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by a very special guest, Robbie Crabtree. Robbie is the founder of On Deck Performative Speaking. Robbie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Eric. I'm super excited to be here. I've listened to a bunch of your episodes and it's great to actually be on one of them and talking with you. Amazing. So, uh, Robbie, we're, we're excited to have you. You've, you've just joined the team. You are leading the performative speaking uh, category. Why don't you describe what is performative speaking and, uh, and maybe let's get, get into your backstory of how you uh, came to, uh, to create the category. Sure. So performative speaking is what I call the philosophy that I created in my years as a lawyer, as a teacher at the SMU Law School, teaching persuasive speaking, coaching the national mock trial team at SMU, and really playing around with these ideas of what it takes to be a great speaker. Because what I was finding was even in a profession like the legal profession, where you expect to see great speaking, most of the time I wasn't. And when I was trying to help other students, I wasn't finding great speaking. And so I wanted to create something that made sense that was able to explain the philosophy that I kind of over my years of experience. And that's where I came to this idea of performative speaking. And I called it that for a couple reasons. And so I think it's really beautiful because the word performative means of or relating to performance art. And I really do think that speaking is performance art because every time we do it, it's a little bit different and it's beautiful and it should feel like music and it should feel like a performance and it should feel like it moves people. Because at the end of the day, what makes great speaking is the emotional impact in the way you make your audience feel. And so if we can think about it as performance art, all of a sudden it opens up this whole new world. But then additionally, the word performativity actually means of like the ability for words to bring about change. And that's so beautiful when we combine this idea of performance art and also the ability for words to bring about change when we're talking about speaking. And that leads me to ultimately coming to On Deck and creating this On Deck performative speaking. So I ran performative speaking, a cohort-based course on my own. I had that going successfully. And then you came in and swooped in and said, hey, I think there's a better situation for you and it's over here with On Deck. And I, I love this idea because if I believe that words can bring about change. And On Deck has all of these world changers and world changing ideas. Why wouldn't I bring that into that ecosystem where those people are already at and say, let's really go out there and use communication, use these speaking skills to put your message out there, send up the bat signal and attract all of those people that need to come your way. Totally. And it's On Deck, it has has founders, builders, uh, investors, uh, creators, Let's talk about what are, what are, uh, what's the mistake or some, some of the mistakes that, that these people make when, uh, when they're speaking. So the biggest mistake people make when it comes to speaking is thinking that it's about just telling the facts, being logical, using reason. And the truth is that is not what moves people. That's not what actually gets results. What you need to do when you're speaking is create emotion, create a mood, create a vibe, And you do this by providing facts and figures and stats, and you do this by using logic and reason. But ultimately, what it comes down to is humans are moved by emotion. And too many times when people are speaking, especially in these higher level kind of fields like we're talking about, they think that the the raw data will tell the story. Truth is, you have to tell the story and you need to make it a story because that's what connects that's what moves people, and that's what really brings out that emotion that allows you to be successful as a speaker. Say more when we talk about the performance speaking approach. Um, like, uh, say, say more about your inspirations as as you've uh, as you've come up with it. So for me, inspirations are honestly everywhere, and I, I write about this. Like, I write about inspirations being like the best meal I ever ate in Lisbon. I write about inspirations being Anthony Bourdain. I write about inspirations being great trial lawyers I've watched. So I love pop culture, right? Like I love using these inspiration sources from movies and television, right? Whether it's Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, whatever it may be, Ex Machina, but it could also be television, Mad Men and Breaking Bad and West Wing and The Wire and all 
Parks and Rec and The Office, like you name it, I can use it. But it can also be crazy things like anime, like Ghost in the Shell or Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood or Yu-Gi-Oh. And so I love these because what we do when we're speaking is we think, what do I want my audience to feel? What emotion do I want them to actually have when I'm speaking to them? What mood, what vibe do I want to create? And then what we do is as a speaker, we think, when have I felt that? And if we know we felt that, let's say it's from one of those sources, I can find it in a TV show, in a, in a movie or something of that nature. I then go find that and reverse engineer it to say, what did they do that was able to create that in me? What was the music? What was the lighting? How did they set that up? What was the structure? What was the pacing of the talking? Were they very slow and intimate? Were they very loud and boisterous, right? And you can use all these sources to reverse engineer and recreate this vibe, this mood, this emotion in your audience. So instead of coming from a place where you're looking at a blank page, we now have an external source to say, this is my guide. This is how I can actually find inspiration from something that doesn't make any sense, but still use it in a way to create that emotion. And it gives us just like this almost unlimited potential to find things to look at and recreate for our audience. Let's talk more about, so just to give people a, a, t- a taster of, 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 of what they can expect. What's, um, whether it's the number one thing people need to remember to be a great speaker or, or maybe a couple things if we've already gotten into it around sort of what separates the, the good from the great at this, what, what, what comes to mind? So I believe, I'm a big believer in everybody needs to be able to tell things in a story format. If you can make things into a story, and story, I think, sometimes gets mistaken for like a fairy tale type thing. That's not what we're talking about story. Story is just like some experience you lived or someone else lived. It's something that happened to you in work that you're just turning into a story that's interesting to highlight a point or to highlight what's important about your company. Too many times people explain what they do for work and they say, like I could say, I'm a lawyer. That's super boring and doesn't like that ends the conversation. Why don't I tell you a story about some case I tried that's much more interesting? If, if I introduce myself and I say, hey, I'm Robbie. And last week I was working with somebody who was trying to get their first job in, in the United States because they didn't speak English when they came here. And they've been trying to get a job for a really long time. But we had to work on their interviewing skills, especially because Zoom. Zoom was really hard for them. They didn't know where to look. They didn't know how to appear confident. And so we worked on this and we worked on this. And then I got an email saying this person got their first job. Well, you see, what I do is I help people become better speakers so that they can land their first job. Something like that is far more interesting and you're telling it through a story. So I think that's a big one. Obviously, creating emotion is another one. And if we're talking about just some real tactical things, you always want to speak slow enough. I think that's actually the biggest problem people have when it comes to speaking. If we're just talking pure tactics, slow down. The words per minute that you want to be speaking at to be comfortable is generally between 110 to 140 words per minute. And there's a really interesting statistic is that JFK was one of the fastest speakers of all time. He spoke at like 300 words, 300 plus words a minute. But when he delivered his inauguration speech, he actually slowed it down where the average word per minute was 97 words per minute. That tactical choice, that very strategic decision to slow it down to that degree was so that your audience could really embrace and feel the impact of every single word. And so while you're in conversation, maybe you can speak faster because you're with friends, it's more informal, whatever that may be. But we're trying to really create a mass impact. We're trying to scale the impact of our words. We want to slow it down. We want to stay in control. We want to make sure our audience can understand what we're saying and process it. Because unlike reading, our audience doesn't get to press pause when they're listening to us speak. They can't say, huh, I don't know what that word means. Let me go look it up on Google and then come back and keep reading. They just have to guess. And if you don't give their brain enough time to piece it together, you've lost them. That's a great point. How about any uh, misconception or any misconceptions people have about how to be a how, how to be a great speaker or common mistakes that people make and don't even realize it? So I look at it this way. People often mistake sounding like a great speaker with being a great speaker. Sounding like a great speaker is step one. And that's where we remove things like ums and uhs. We slow down the pacing. We start to play with those things that we think of when it comes to a great speaker. But here's the problem. If you just sound like a great speaker and you don't actually know the strategy piece behind what you're trying to achieve, you don't know how to move people, you don't understand human psychology, you don't understand how to create that real 
inspiration, that action in your audience, you may sound like a great speaker, but you'll never be a great speaker because you're not moving people to action. So there's a second step that is actually far more important than sounding like a great speaker. And that's this mindset piece, a strategy piece, more of kind of these things that, in all honesty, I learned a lot about as a trial lawyer. I learned a lot reading and studying. I learned a lot when I had to teach persuasive speaking to students because you really have to get into that world and understand what is this strategy piece? What is this mindset piece? And you also talk to great, great speakers. Like I am fortunate to talk to people like Justin Mikaloy, who was the speechwriter for General Mattis and General Petraeus. And you talk about how they design speeches, how they're thinking through it, because I'm much better for asking for help from tons of people and getting it from them and getting their advice and getting their ideas. And that's the other misconception people have is great speakers all steal from one another. We steal and we remix and we make new ideas. And that is one of the beautiful things about being a speaker is you're not starting from scratch. You don't have to invent the wheel. It's all out there. You just get to mesh it together and make it really pretty in your authentic voice. Totally. Let's talk about some of the uh, common formats that people need to sort of, uh, you know, be a great speaker for and any sort of, um, you know, quick, quick frameworks that, that you, that you have uh, on them. How, how about a, uh, a pitch to, to investors? W- what's important for people to think about there? Yeah. So, I mean, if I like to call a pitch to investors is very conclusion based pitch, you need to give them the why they are, should be interested. You need to do it in a very tight time frame, but you also need to be doing it by telling the story as well. And so what that really requires is using a lot of kind of descriptive language terms that are going to create emotion, like some very important keywords. Maybe you use something like it's going to be like a tidal wave coming to shore. That's a very descriptive little phrase right there. And you can use that to create emotion in your audience without having to tell this huge long story. But we really want to focus on what are the numbers? What are the things that are exciting? Where can I see the purpose behind the idea, the potential for where it can go, and the passion for that founder who's selling the idea. Totally. totally. How, how about uh, an interview uh, or like a podcast interview, both in terms of the person being interviewed and how to do that well, uh, and then the person conducting the interview? Yeah, so much of a great podcast, right, comes down to conversational skills. How good are you at active listening and how good are you at asking good questions? And when it comes to active listening, this is a, a huge problem that people have. We just don't listen. How many times have we introduced ourselves? And this probably happens more in real life because now we have the Zoom screen that shows us the name, but you introduce yourself and you don't even hear the other person's name because we're so caught up in thinking about the next thing we're going to say, or even like maybe we're caught up in saying our name to them. How ridiculous is that? We know our name. Another one I love to use as an example is I ask people this when I would prep them as a witness is I would say, do you know what time it is? Now that question most people would answer like this. They would look at their watch or look at their phone and tell me what time it was. But that wasn't the question. The question was, do you know what time it is? That is a yes or no answer. And what it's, dis- what it's displaying is people aren't listening to what's actually being said to them. They're making assumptions. They're trying to formulate things in their head. So being great right on a podcast is really listening and then being comfortable enough to take that pause at the end of it. Think through what you want to respond with and go from there. And asking great questions is really coming down again to listening to what was just said and building off of that, not making it something that's choppy, but instead really tying it together so it feels like it's just one long journey. And by the end of it, you kind of have this feeling of like, how did we even get here? But then when you trace it back, you're like, oh, of course we ended up here because it was so natural and free flowing because you're showing, you're listening, you're engaged, and you're asking the right questions. How about panels? So panels require a level of preparation. And I think that that's a a mistake that a lot of people don't don't take because you need to know who the moderator is, what their goal is. You need to know what the conference is about and what the goal is there. You need to know who your other panelists are and kind of where you fit in with them. What's their expertise? What's yours? How are you different? How are you alike? What are they going to try to do? What do you want to try to do? But then when you're on the panel, you again want to be more conversational, and at the same time, be demonstrating your credibility and likability. So I think one of the big things when you're going on a panel, and this is what I coach 
a lot of people I work with who are kind of going on these types of, of panels is be prepared to have some really tight stories and then have some actionable points at the end of them. Because what it allows you to do is demonstrate that you're likable and it's entertaining while at the same time giving something to your audience that they can take away and put into action at the end of it. Uh, the, um, how about a, a keynote? How do, how, do, how do we do those well? So a keynote obviously is going to depend on, again, where you're giving it, what kind of time limit you have. But my opinion is a keynote should be one main idea. So it should be one main theme. You should break it up into sub themes within that. Now, a longer speech is obviously going to have more sub themes. And what I mean by this is if you had your speech written out and it fell on the floor, you should be able to say any one of those pieces and it makes sense on its own. But you should also be able to put them in order and say, yeah, this one clearly follows this one. This one clearly goes next. And by doing that, when you put it all together, you say, oh yeah, this one big theme is this. Now, when you're doing that again, you want to tell it in an interesting way and a way that connects with your audience. So again, this is a great place to really develop great storytelling while still talking about something that's very interesting and essentially creating a lesson out of the story. The example I love to use for something like this is think about why the Iliad and the Odyssey survived for thousands of years through oral tradition, now written down, and now we study it. And in fact, there's even movies, right? Troy. And it all comes down to the fact that they tell stories to teach lessons. And you can think of a keynote in that same way. A story is going to keep your audience engaged but it's also going to deliver a lesson. I think there's a great one where there was a a commencement speech at UT and it was a a Navy Admiral, I believe. And he gave the, the speech and it was basically make your bed in the morning. And he talked about a lot of these things. You can do simple actions that set you up for success. But everyone I talked to about that speech remembers one thing, make your bed in the morning. So you need to remember when you're delivering a keynote speech, your audience is generally going to remember one main thing. So make sure that you make it count. That's a, that's, a great, that's a great point. And you mentioned storytelling. What are the ingredients of a, of, of a great story? Uh, or what are you know, common mistakes people make when, when, when trying to, to tell a great story or misconceptions people have about it? Sure. So when it comes to storytelling, there's what I say are really five main ingredients that make a great story that you need to build out. And those five ingredients are you need characters, but not just, it can't just be my brother. Like you need to describe your characters. You need to make them real. Like I would never just say I talked with Eric the other day to somebody who doesn't know me. Like that means nothing to them. They would have no idea who's Eric. But if I tell them Eric, the founder of On Deck, who does all this other stuff, he runs a podcast. He lives out in California. Like I can give you real depth of character. So now they start to say, oh, Eric, the founder of On Deck. And it starts to resonate with them. And maybe they don't know what you look like, but they at least have more than just Eric. Eric is just a generic stick figure, right? So first off, we always want to develop our characters. Second, we want to develop the relationships between those characters. So if I have friends, I can't just say my friend Jeremy, my friend John, my friend James. Nobody has any idea what those relationships mean. So I need to build those out, right? My best friend, Jeremy, who I met when I was in 10th grade. My good friend, John, who came when I was in 11th grade and like joined our friend group. You want to start building out these relationships or if you have multiple brothers and sisters, my older brother, uh, you know, my older brother, Paul, my younger brother, Sam, you want different identifiers so people understand the relationship to each other and, and can really grasp on who those people are. The third thing you want to have in any great story is the environment. So if I was telling a story and I said it happened in Dallas, you have no idea what that means. It could be in a high rise in Dallas. It could be at a park in Dallas. Granted, we don't have many of those in Dallas, but you might not know that. So like you need to tell people the environment, explain it, describe it. What does it look like? And so it gives a lot of depth. So we want to describe these things so people are seeing it because really what stories come down to is you want your audience at the end of it saying, I felt like I was right there with you. I could see it. I could hear it. I could smell it, right? We want those sort of emotions coming out of our audience. Now, the fourth thing is you always need some sort of conflict. And that just means there's some point at issue in the story, right? It doesn't have to be a serious conflict. It doesn't have to be a fight. It doesn't have to be something terrible. 
It just needs to be something that is at issue in your story. And then the last thing is you need a resolution. That's just to finish. You, you don't want to leave your audience hanging unless you're trying to create a cliffhanger to lead into something different, right? And we've all, we all know what a cliffhanger is, but most of the time when you're telling a story, you want to wrap it up. What happens too often is people just run out of steam. They don't know where the story ends and they end up doing something like this. So at the end of the day, you know, so, and they stop there as if like, so is an acceptable way to finish that story. Like I am expecting you to tell me more at that point. And we always want to make sure the audience gets this idea of a finish because the two most important parts of any kind of talk that you can give is the very beginning and the very end. They're the two things that the audience remembers most. And it comes down to this idea of primacy and recency. Primacy being the first thing they hear, recency being the most recent thing they hear, right? And if you don't nail that finish, you've basically left them with, I don't know what happened. I don't understand why I just listened to this. That was a waste of my time. So we always want to finish strong. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. Thanks for that, that, that sort of analysis. T- talk a bit about uh, the, the curriculum itself. Uh, what, what can people be, expect uh, to, to learn by, by going through the program? Uh, you, maybe you've, you've dropped some tidbits th- throughout, but what, what more can people expect from, from the curriculum during the program? Yeah, I mean, basically they can expect eight weeks of live, like live sessions, right? Where we're going, going through it and really just building out these skills. And it's going to cover a number of topics. And I'll quickly kind of go over those topics for you because people may be interested. And so week one basically is going to go through the mindset of the speaker. And this is a lot of different things, strategy pieces. This is how to build confidence, how to be authentic in your voice, how to make sure that we're speaking from a place that is ethical, right? Because there is always a risk that people can use some of this stuff for manipulation. And I don't ever want that to be the case. So I want to make sure people understand, like, let's have the right mindset going into this. Let's do some good with what we're, what we're going to teach throughout the course. So that's really where we start. Then we go into the, the creation process. And that's how do we actually go from like this idea of a blank page to creating something? What does that look like? What are those frameworks? What's that thought process? Like, how do we think? Because so many times people come to me and just struggle with, I don't even know where to start. Like it's lost to them. So we want to make sure people understand how to actually create an impactful speech, a pitch, a talk, a keynote, right? Anything that it may be, give them the tools. So from there, then we go into some storytelling because I think storytelling is really fundamental. If you understand that skill, it's going to take you really far. Even if it's a conclusion-based pitch, you're trying to raise money. You still want to be able to tell your story. Now you're doing it in a much tighter way, And you're trying to limit, it's not as flowery language, it's not as flowy, right? It's much more compact, but you still need to be able to tell that story. So that's really where week three comes in. Then in week four, we start talking about the five elements of a great speech. Then in week five, we go into framing and how to properly frame. And this goes into some structure as well to make sure that we're doing the right things because too often times, People are putting bad facts or bad things about their their story, their talk, their pitch, their presentation at the beginning and essentially sinking all of their chance of ever being successful. So we've got to learn about proper framing and structuring. Then we go into tactics. And this is something that a lot of people think of. It's the rhythm and pacing. It's the speed. It's using things like floating opposites, using the rule of three, using thing one unlike the other really these tools that like our ears perk up when we hear them. Then we also are going to go into the last two weeks are going to be conversational skills. And that'll be some like active listening, great questions, those sort of things, mirroring techniques so that you're actually really connecting with the other person you're speaking with. And then the last week we'll go into what I call tactical discussions. And this is just more of an idea of let's go in and realize every conversation is a chance to learn something, a chance to build a connection and how do we do that? And maybe there's some high, high level conversations we're going to go into. Let's say you want to get a raise from your boss. Well, that would be a great time to use some of this tactical discussion type language. And this is really just setting yourself up for success. When you choose to have that conversation, how you frame it, how you're setting things up, how you're talking to them. So you can have the most positive interaction as possible because it's a difficult conversation to bring up. 
So let's give people the tools to handle that. Or maybe they're resigning and leaving to go to a new job, but you don't want to burn that bridge. Let's teach people how to do that in an effective way. And so that's what we'll be going through. That's a core curriculum. Then there's obviously elective pieces to go into a lot of things you talked about, keynote addresses, pitches, storytelling. All of those sort of things are going to be in there. There's guest workshops that are going to be there where people are going to come in and talk about these skills. And then <clears throat> additionally, there's going to be office hours and a thing called, that I call CrossFit for speaking. And that's something I'm super excited about. I think people are going to have a ton of fun doing CrossFit for speaking. Do you want to share just a little bit about uh, uh, what that is for people unfamiliar? I mean, I imagine most people are unfamiliar because it's it's a concept. So I took CrossFit from writing, which David Perel does, turn into CrossFit for speaking, which I do, and now run that. And that is essentially this idea. We're going to have people come in, blank pays, nothing on it. And in 90 minutes, they're going to create. I'm going to give them the pieces and basically put them through like a very time crunch process to create a rough draft version of a pitch, a talk, a story, whatever they want to focus on that day. But in the process of doing that, there's multiple breakout sessions where they actually go in with other fellows and get to give feedback, get feedback and really build together in this really tight timeframe. And what it does, it just creates this incredible sense of community. It's really fun. At the end of it, you finish and you walk away and you all of a sudden realize in 90 minutes, I can create something and create something really high quality. And I think that's such a switch that flips for people where they realize this isn't something that needs to take days. This is something that when I get the frameworks, when I understand the process, because I'll walk them through that, it becomes something that all of a sudden they can do and do very quickly and very well. That's awesome. And, and talk about what it's like, how this all changes in a COVID world uh, when we're not getting on stage and doing public speaking. What is sort of the importance of speaking in, in, in a Zoom world? And how, how can people be thinking about you know, doing a great job at it? Yeah, it's more important now than ever in my opinion. And that's because we no longer have those little little interactions on a day-to-day basis with coworkers. We're not building up that kind of personal capital because we're just interacting. So when we're on a Zoom call, we get one chance to leave a really impact, impactful talk on that person to make sure we leave our mark, which means you've got to take advantage when it comes to speaking. If you're not nailing it, you're missing opportunities. And we don't want that to happen. We want you to stand out. Anybody who comes in to the course or is listening to this, we want that person to stand out on the Zoom screen. And that means you need to be hyper aware of the things that it takes to be a great speaker from your pacing, from your body language, from using your face, using your hands. You need to be doing these things so you can demonstrate why people should be listening to you because we're all, we're disconnected, right? The screen disconnects us. There's no energy between us like there would be in person. So we have to amplify that and make sure our words do even more heavy lifting, make sure our facial expressions do even more heavy lifting because we still want to create that impact on somebody, except now we have less time and a harder time to do it. So we need to be more intentional with the approach we take. Yeah, totally. Talk, talk about the importance of, of, of community as it relates to uh, becoming a better speaker. Yeah, I think community is one of those magic pieces to this. Because lots of people understand they need to be a better speaker, but it's hard to just go on camera and do it yourself and get better. Like you don't want to do that. But when you're in a community, you're on this journey together. So it gives you this accountability. It gives you this support, but it also gives you a peer group to learn from. And I think one of the things that helped me the most to become the speaker that I am today is watching other great speakers all the time. That was one of the things I did early on in my career is I would go and listen to speakers, politicians, anybody giving a talk, pastors, preachers, whatever it may be, and just try to absorb as much of their good stuff as I could possibly absorb and take the things I thought that might work for me and mold that into who I was. When community, you get to listen to, you know, 100, 150 people with different styles, different approaches. And you're going to be exposed to these ideas. And you're going to, like, I'm going to tell you right now, like I'm going to have moments where I'm going to say, I'm going to steal that. And I'll tell people that I'm going to be like, I'm using that because it would be that good. I do that in the the previous, in my course, performance speaking before I joined on deck, there were talks where I would literally tell people, I am taking that from you and using it. It is that good. 
And I'd say, please do the same with me. Please do the same with everybody. Like that is part of this game. It's so much fun because you see something that works and it's just like, that's brilliant. Like I want that. That's the, the, the power of this community side is you get exposed to so many approaches, so many experiences and ways of doing things. And it's just really beautiful. And at the same time, it's fun because public speaking is tough. People struggle with it. It can be scary. It can create nervousness, but you're creating this group of friends, colleagues, and just a network that ends up becoming, I mean, I use the term friends, but like it's, it becomes much more than that. And you create these really special bonds where you're lifting each other up and really inspiring each other to get far better than you would if you were just doing it on your own, because you wouldn't be driven towards success as much because you want to make sure you, your friends are watching you. Like you want to essentially show off for them and they want to do the same for you. And then it kind of becomes a competition, but it also becomes very supportive and it's just this beautiful flywheel effect. And I know at on deck, we love flywheels. It's like, this is perfect. Like the community aspect is honestly a flywheel for improvement when it comes to speaking. And it works beautifully. Like the things I've seen already in a speaking community, it is absolutely mind blowing. We did a capstone project at the end of the course I just ran in the last week. Every student gave a live speech, except they only gave a speech one night because we had to spread it out over three nights. Every single student showed up to watch every single speech over those three nights. People were bringing their spouses and live streaming it up onto the television to watch it. And in the chat, there were just thousands of comments that were blowing up because people were so inspired and moved by what was going on. And it was the most incredible thing, incredible experience to see the transformation of those people. And it I mean, I certainly had a role to play, but it was the community that really drove it. And that's why I just think it's a beautiful flywheel that, that occurs. Totally. That's awesome. Uh, Talk a bit about the the long-term vision for what what you, uh, what you hope this becomes. So I think a lot of people are familiar with the idea of a Toastmasters. They're familiar with like some of the work, like a Tony Robbins has certainly done and all of that. But we're really moving into this world where we can reach more people at scale because of the ability to do these things online and do them really well. And people are doing more remote work. They're not going in the office. Things are changing. And my long-term vision is for on-deck performance speaking to be the place people come to really elevate this skill, to become great public speakers, to be that next generation of powerhouse speakers that are delivering TED Talks that are giving commencement addresses, that are the ones who are in demand and who are also using this skill to push out their ideas into the world and really bring about change. And I think there's just an ability to really impact tens of thousands of lives on a regular basis inside the OnDeck community because every one of the fellowships inside of OnDeck can benefit from OnDeck performative speaking. And every person outside of it can benefit from on-deck performative speaking. The beautiful thing is we have a real chance to impact people on a huge scale. We're no longer do you have to go to Toastmasters and worry about driving and making sure you, you know, you're there and you're wasting your lunch hour and you really wish that you were just relaxing instead. And maybe you get up and you get to give one speech and you're not really that connected to the people who are in your class because they're all just kind of jumping in and out all the time. This has the opportunity to not only be the best speaking environment, but also to be the strongest community where you're meeting the people that you go out and you build in the next decade and the decades to come, because these are the types of people that you want to be around, that you want to build with, and that you want to be friends with for the rest of your life. That's awesome. That's a, that's a perfect place to, to wrap. And, and we are releasing this podcast on the day that we launch uh, on deck performative speaking. So, so do check it out, uh, uh, be on deck.com. Uh, you'll be, you'll be able to find it. Um, Robbie, for people who want to go uh, deeper, wh- wh- where else can you, uh, where else can you point them? Yeah, obviously you can find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. That is at Robbie crab. You can also go to my personal website, which is Robbie I write a lot on there about some of these ideas and things. Those are the two best places to find me. Of course, if you're interested or you want to talk to me, Again, 
Twitter's great. You can also always email me. It's Robbie at beyonddeck.com. I am happy to answer any email, any Twitter DM. Like this is stuff I love. I really believe in the power of public speaking and how it can transform people's lives and just open these opportunities that people don't even know exist yet. And that's always the exciting thing. So please, please reach out to me anywhere. I'm happy to talk anytime, any day, you name it. I'll give out my cell phone. I don't care. We'll talk. Awesome. Uh, Robbie, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a great episode. Thanks, Eric. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.